Alright, Ronan MMA, welcome back to the channel. Now, UFC Fight Night Dawson vs. Green takes place this Saturday. I want to go over every single fight on the card, give a bit of a preview, and also my pick for every single fight on this card. We start with the early prelim opener, work our way up. I try to go through the earlier ones a little bit faster so I can spend more time on the co-main event, main event, things like that. So let's get started right away. The first fight of the night is Montella De La Rosa versus JJ Aldrich. She was supposed to be fighting somebody else. This is a short notice opponent. Stephanie Eager pulled out. Aldrich is coming off of a good finish her last time out, which is surprising for her. This fight could literally be a coin flip. I have no idea who to pick. I've gone back and forth multiple times. I've said on JJ Aldridge simply because she's got a bit of momentum behind her. Montella De, De La Rosa is coming off of a couple of losses. She also lost to Macy Barber and not recently. Do you know what I mean? Macy Barber's made some definite improvements um, and doesn't necessarily throw head kicks from 30 feet away. But JJ Aldridge has some momentum behind her, as I said. You know what I mean? She got a finish last time out. I was surprised by that and it was nice to see. Now, to be fair, Montella De La Rosa recently hasn't necessarily lost. Two horrible competitions. She was finished by Tatiana Suarez. And, you know, like, it is what it is, dude. I'm going to go with J.J. Aldridge. She obviously feels healthy enough and confident enough to take a short-notice opponent. As I said, coming off of a very good finish. And Montella De La Rosa, just, she doesn't have a whole lot of impressive wins on her record. The best performance, I guess you could say, is that she went to a draw with Maria Bueno Silva, who just popped. Also, her win over and Ariana Lepsky, I guess, aged pretty well, but that was a good while ago. So I'm gonna go with JJ Aldridge here. I don't know how, probably decision. This is honestly a coin flip fight, not overly confident in my pick. Anyways, moving up the card to Nate Maness versus Mateos Mendoza. All right, both these dudes have reached much longer than their height. Okay, Mendoza or Mendoza, whatever the fuck, is five foot six with a five foot 11 and a half reach or equivalent to he's got a massive ape index okay Maness is on a two-fight skid goes to a decision with Umar Nurmagomedov but then gets finished by Ulimbekov okay Mendonca lost a decision to Javid Basrat who to be fair is an undefeated savage but hasn't got a whole lot of finishes or actually any since coming into the UFC sometimes this uh this method or this you know it do it doesn't necessarily work out for me all the time but I'm gonna go with Nate Maness based on the level of competition that he's faced in Mendonca's Mendonca whatever dude in his eighth fight dude fought a guy making his debut I don't necessarily like to see that he's also very young and I could see Nate Maness having like that old man strength he's not old but do you know what I mean full grown man fully into his body strength over Mateos Mendonca especially in the grappling and clinch scenarios he's also got a five foot height advantage which I guess doesn't mean a whole lot considering their reaches are very close but it could cause problems for Mendonca now both these guys get a lot of finishes both of them have a good mix of finishes subs knockouts as well so this fight should be very exciting there should be a finish and I think that Mendonca will get finished by submission Nate Maness by submission moving up the card too Vanessa Dimopoulos Versus Kaneko Morelta. Okay, this fight is damn near, dude. This is like the midget league. We got Vanessa Demopoulos, who's five foot two, Morata, five foot one, almost legally a dwarf. Okay, but Vanessa, a little thick. Okay, she missed weight last time out against Carolina K, who is old, but has kind of reignited her career. And we're going to talk about her a little bit later because she is also on this card. But still. Vanessa doesn't have a whole lot of impressive wins. She's 35 years old. She's 9-5, and five, dude. Like, that's not great, okay? Fighting younger women with more experience and a way better record in Maruta, okay? I'm going to go with Kanoko Maruta. By the way, this lady has two Von Flew chokes, okay? So I would like to see her get another one, get closer to Ovin St. Peru's record. I believe he has four in total in his career. She got those Vaughn flu chokes in Ryzen, and she's also got good experience in Invicta. So she's fighting good girls, good competition. I'm going to go with her by submission. As I said, I'd like to see her get another Vaughn, uh, Vaughn flu choke. That would be phenomenal. Moving up the card, too. Ariel, oh my god, I fucking knew how to say this guy's name, and now I'm drawing a blank. Arioli Leng, Ariel Leng, either way, versus Munoz Jr. Okay, both these guys have not done well in the UFC. Munoz, 2-3. and three. Ariel Leng. Two and three also, and one of his losses was to Jeff Molina, which is just unfucking forgivable. Okay, also to Cody Durden, both of those by decision. Which to be fair, dude, Jeff Molina, I know we joke about him a lot due to the tape that came out, but he was a good fighter, and he really he only got released due to the betting scandal that happened. So you know what I mean? He could have been potentially a top contender. Who knows? He did have a lot of skills. 
in multiple areas of life, okay? And Cody Durden is also pretty good. So c considering he, you know, went to decision with both of those guys, it's not the worst thing in the world. Now, last time out, he did get flatlined by Eamon Zahabi. I did pick Eamon Zahabi to win that fight, by the way, which I do think he might have been, been an underdog, but regardless, okay? That was the first time he's ever been knocked out, which is pretty impressive considering he's got, what, 35 pro fights? The guy's been fighting for a very long time. Ariel Leng, Ariel Leng, Jesus fuck, dude. Has lost by submission three times, however. Now, most of them were earlier on in his career. He doesn't necessarily get the finish, right? He gets a, he wins decisions more often than not when he does win. Munoz Jr. has seven subs, two KOs, with only three decisions. So this dude is a finisher. He's younger. He's taken less damage. He has been knocked out, if I'm not mistaken, once or twice. But either way, dude, the number that stands out to me most is his submissions. Having seven subs on the record considering he's only got, I believe, 14 fights, is pretty impressive. Half of his wins coming by way of submission. I do think that he might be able to get a rear naked choke over Aori Lang. I think I said it perfectly that time, dude. Let's fucking go. Aori Lang. That's how you say it, bro. It just came back, okay? I do think he'll be able to get a rear naked choke. That seems to be his signature move. He's got a few arm bars also, but, you know, more often than not, when he does get a sub, it is the rear naked choke. Moving up the card to Chris Gutierrez versus Montel Jackson. This is a fucking banger fight. I'm very excited for this fight. Uh, Chris Gutierrez, in my opinion, is very good. He had a super competitive fight with Pedro Munoz. And I know that a lot of people like the dog on Munoz. I think that Pedro Munoz is underrated. I don't care how old he is. He's good. He's a fucking monster, dude. Gets hit with crazy shit. Never goes down. And I just, I know that people shit on him. Especially because of the O'Malley fight and whatnot. But. He's good, man. And Chris Gutierrez showed us that he is on the level of a Pedro Munoz who is ranked in the top 10 of the bantamweight division, which is one of the most stacked divisions in the UFC now. Montel Jackson actually has an incredible UFC record. He's 7-2 and two so far, okay? That's a good record. Now, he likes to get KOs, but since being in the UFC, he's only gotten two of them. So a lot of those KOs you see on his record came from earlier competition when he was fighting guys with 20 and 36 record and a 1 and 4 record and shit like that. He fought a lot of guys who've got some questionable records, questionable amounts of experience. To be fair though, he's had, you know, he, Ricky Simone's a tough debut, so he lost that one. Since then, only losing to Brett John. So as I said, he's very good in the UFC. He just hasn't been able to get the same amount of finishes as he did earlier in his career when he was fighting guys with shit records. Now, I know that Jackson has somewhat of a ground game. I do believe he's got one sub on his record, but... I don't, man, dude's taking JP buys to a decision. Do you know what I mean? So, I don't know, man. He got a KO over Ronnie Yaya, who's damn near 40. I can't remember who the other KO was over, but it wasn't somebody overly impressive. Otherwise, I'm sure I would fucking remember it. Chris Gutierrez is young, sniper-like, very good on the feet, very educated with his kicking game, with range management and shit like that. Montel Jackson's going to have to close the distance because he likes to land big, heavy shots with the hands. And I do think that Chris Gutierrez is going to be able to make it very difficult for him with his kicks and things like that. Um, I think that he eventually finds a KO shot to bounce back after that ultra competitive fight with Pedro Munoz, which also showed us that the dude's tough as fucking nails also because he got hit with some shit in that fight, okay? And if you look at Montel Jackson's record, there's no real top-notch high-level strikers on there that he's actually fought. And in my opinion, Chris Gutierrez is that. He may be lacking a little bit of a ground game, but I don't think that Montel Jackson's going to be able to just easily take him down and submit him. So I'm going to go with Chris Gutierrez by TKO. Moving up the card too, Karolina Kovalkiewicz versus Deanna Belbita came in. Fuck it, dude. I'm going with the old lady. I'm going with Karolina Kovalkiewicz, okay? She may be old, and she has a lot of losses, but she has definitely resurged her career. She's on a three-fight win streak. She looked like an absolute fucking savage against Vanessa Dimopoulos, who, by the way, missed weight for that fight. So more often than not, we see the fighter that misses weight win a battle because they do have a significant advantage over their opponent because they didn't have to dehydrate themselves as much, and they're able to rehydrate much easier than their opponent, Karolina Kovalkiewicz. If you look at her losses, dude... They've all aged unbelievably well, okay? Yan Zhao Nan will probably be fighting for a title soon. That lady is a fucking savage, all right? Alexa Grasso is a champion up a weight class, right? She shouldn't have been at 115 all along. She, clearly, do you know what I mean? She was big for that weight class. She looks, like, large for 125, and I'm not saying that she's fat or nothing like that, but you know what I mean, dude. Lost to Joanna. Look, even the, even the Andrade fight, back then, her game was not as outdated, 
as it is today. So it's, you know, people have kind of figured it out. That loss was five fucking years ago also. And we know that she has manpower. Do you know what I mean? So either way, as I said, three fight win streak looked like a savage last time out. Deanna Belbita lost to Molly fucking McCann. Do you know what I mean? She's three and two in the UFC and the women she has beaten are not anything special. In my opinion, I am going to go with Karolina Kovalkiewicz to get the job done by unanimous decision. Deanna Belbita could catch her, I guess. She has some KOs on her record, but she doesn't have a single finish since joining the UFC. Do you know what I mean? So she's fighting ladies when she's 12 and 4, 16 fights in her 17th fight, fighting a lady, a lady, pardon me, <laughs> with a 1 and 2 record. Okay. In her 14th fight, she fought a girl making her debut. I do not like to see that shit. Padded records. Karolina Kovalkiewicz is fighting the best of the best for a very long fucking time. So I will be going with her to get the job done by unanimous decision. I don't know what the odds are. She might be an underdog, but it is what it is. Moving up the card to Alexander Hernandez versus Bill Algio. Okay, first of all, dude, Bill Algio based as fuck. Absolutely. He got a good win last time out over TJ Brown, subbed him in the second round. Dude pushes a pace, okay? He's never been finished in the UFC. He's only lost to, in my opinion, pretty good guys or very good guys, depending on how you look at it. Ricardo Lamos, Ricardo Hamos, and Andre Feely, okay? All of these guys, I feel, are a little underrated, especially when he fought them. Hernandez is super inconsistent, man. Like, he's damn near a coin flip, okay? Barely skating by against Jim Miller, who's f fucking old. And I don't mean it, like, in terms of MMA, he's old, okay? He's had a very long career. I do believe he's 40, if not older, okay? He had Lyme disease for a lar large portion of his career. The dude, it, it was a very competitive fight, okay? And Bill Algio is a fucking beast, right? He's a beast, and he pushes a pace, and he's only ever lost by decision in the UFC, which means he can take a shot, because it's not like he's fighting total fucking bums the entire time. I see him being able to break Hernandez down with his pace, with his durability also. I think that it, he may get tagged a few times, but I think he'll ultimately recover, keep pushing the pace on Hernandez, and eventually getting like a late second round or third round submission or a TKO where Hernandez is kind of up against the fence, just kind of curled up, not necessarily flatlined on his back but maybe takes a knee and is just getting fucking obliterated up against the cage i alexander hernandez has showed us flashes of very good skill and talent and things like that but he just can't seem to like hold it together the dude doesn't like adversity we know this and we knew this ever since he fought donald cowboy cerrone because he was so used to being a hammer that when it wasn't working for him dude kind of folded a little bit um yeah, I'm going to go with Bill Aljo by submission. Late late round sub or TKO. Late rounds, pardon me. Moving up the card to Felipe Lenz versus Ion Cotilava. God damn it, dude. These ones are tough to pick, man. I don't fucking know. Lenz is damn near 40. Been fairly inactive also, okay? This is the first year he's fought three times since 2018. He had a pretty big two-year layoff in between 2020 and 2022 after he beat Arlovsky and finished Tanner Bozer. So I don't know if he was injured or what happened, but regardless, he had a massive layoff. I think he had one canceled fight in that time span. Ion Kutilaba has a bit of a problem with grappling, right? Dude, almost every time he lost, uh, loses, pardon me, he gets finished. That's, a, that's another problem I have with him. He got finished three times in a row. Ryan Spann, Johnny Walker, and Kennedy Nuzinchuku. Nuzinchuku, whatever, dude. Either way. Not a great look. Okay, but before that, beating Devin Clark and then got finished by Anka Liev in their rematch after that weird stoppage by the mini Mark Goddard. He's got some good wins, man, but he's very inconsistent. Also, age is less of a factor at the higher weight classes, so I don't know how much I want to value in the fact that Felipe Lenz is fucking damn near 40. Do you know what I mean? The only thing that's giving me trouble for picking this fight is that Lenz hasn't fought nearly the competition that Ion Kutilaba has. Like, when you lose to a guy like Uncle Live, it's kind of understandable. Johnny Walker has showed us that he has made massive improvements also. And dude was getting crazy finishes early on in his career anyways. It wasn't really till he fought the top guys that we realized, oh, he's lacking in a few departments. He seems to have corrected and remedied all of those holes that he had in his game. Ryan Spann shows us sometimes he can be good and sometimes he apparently doesn't fucking train or have an actual coach. So it is what it is, and we know that that's bullshit, but either fucking way, dude. Uh, Linz has been KO'd four times, but, you know, Kutilab has been KO'd three times also. So, the four sub losses is, is fucking with me a little bit on, like, Ion Kutilaba's record. The dude does not like to grapple. 
I don't know if Linz is going to be able to get the takedown, though. I don't know if he's going to be explosive enough. I don't know if Kutilab is probably extremely strong, and Felipe Linz isn't, like, some massive fucking beefed-up dude. I don't know how, as I said, explosive he'll be. I don't know if he'll be able to close the distance. Without getting cracked, I will go with Ian Kutilab, but I am not overly confident in this pick. I tell you what, dude. He is all... He's like the fucking light heavyweight Alexander Hernandez. Moving up to card two, Drew the Angel of Death Dober. No, I'm just kidding, dude. Drew Dober versus Ricky Glenn. All right, both of these lads coming off of KO losses. Drew Dober will not be at full power due to the color of Ricky Glenn's skin. However, I think Drew Dober can potentially find the chin. I'm not super confident in this. Ricky Glenn's last loss was the first time he's ever been KO'd, which is pretty fucking impressive considering his age and the career that he's had, but it might be a sign of things to come. Do you know what I mean? Drew Dober, we know, gets in crazy fucking wars, and sometimes it doesn't go his way. Sometimes it does, more often than not. And also, I think Matt Fr- Matt Frivola, pardon me, Matt the Steamroller Frivola is fucking underrated, dude. Guy's pretty goddamn good, okay? And aside from that loss, Drew Dober is only losing to top level guys. Aside one more loss, Brad Riddell. But to be fair, Brad Riddell has not had a very successful career in the UFC, He is a very good kickboxer. He is very good at range management. He would be able to keep Drew Dober at the end of his range with the kicks and shit like that. So I, you know, that one's kind of understandable also. Brad Riddell had moments early on in his career. Do you know what I mean? Islam, uh, Dariush is another guy he lost to. Even Olivier, oh fucking dude, he's Canadian and I can't even say his name. Olivier Aubin Mercier, Aubin fucking, dude, what? Oliver Aubin Mercier, who has gone on to win the PFL tournament. I'm gonna go with Drew Duber landing a giant hook on the chin after a bit of a nasty fucking war because that's typically how Drew Dober does shit. Now moving up the card to Alex Morono versus Joaquin Buckley. Okay, this is a all dude. This is another tricky one. I think I looked up the odds. I can't remember what they were. Alex Morono is a fairly sizable underdog, if I'm not mistaken. I could have looked at a fucked up website, but who knows? He is a tricky dude to deal with. Okay, he's underrated, very underrated. He's got an awkward style. He gave Ponzinibbio all he could handle. If Ponzinibbio didn't find that finish in the last couple minutes, he might have lost that fucking fight. Do you know what I mean? Like, Alex Morono was doing work, and he can take a shot. Like, that wasn't the first shot he got hit with in that fight. Do you know what I mean? So, problem for me is, is he does sometimes get tagged with power punches, punchers pardon me, who are not, or at least in my opinion, not very skillful guys like chaos williams who finished him right like i don't necessarily like to see that because in my opinion chaos williams really only has his power to rely on buckley kind of fucking also dude though do you know what i mean that kick if that kick didn't happen which it was one of the most beautiful ko's maybe the most beautiful ko i've ever seen in ufc history i don't think anybody would know who the fuck this guy is and i'm not trying to be shitty man because it was a phenomenal kick a beautiful finish But if it didn't happen, I just think that nobody would know who the fuck he was, okay? So it is what it is. Now, maybe he has made some improvements moving down. He did get a head kick finish last time out over Andre Fialo, if I'm not mistaken, who is okay, dude. I'm going to go with the underdog, Alex Morono, okay? I'm going with him. I'm going to trust in him to see Buckley's big loaded up shots, not get hit with some dumb shit like like a giant fucking roundhouse kick or something. Be awkward like he is. Push a pace like he does. Cause problems for Bucky. Uh, bl- fucking Buckley, dude. My bad, dude. Buckwheat. Tiring him out, um, you know, with his style and his pace. Making that all those big muscles get fucking tired and, you know, just wilt him. Probably unanimous decision. For Alex Morono, hopefully. Moving up the car to Joe Pfeiffer versus Abdul Razak Al-Hassan. This is a phenomenal fight. I'm actually very excited for this. I will go with Joe Pfeiffer. Fuck, man. Al Hassan could catch him, dude. That guy's got a ton of KOs, okay? He got a KO last time out against Claudio Ribeiro. Pfeiffer's a savage. He's got two finishes since coming into the UFC. Now, to be fair, they're not against the best guys. Like, GM3's good, but on any given day, he's fucking garbage. All, almost all the finish... I mean, he almost gets only finishes. The dude's really good. And I'm gonna be honest, though. I'm a little skeptical on this pick. If I'm not mistaken, I looked on a certain website. He was a 3-1... to one favorite which is kind of crazy so i don't know that i would throw a whole lot of money on this fight because abdul razak al Hassan could fucking catch him and if i'm not mistaken joe pfeiffer has been ko'd once in his career do you know what i mean yeah he has he has been ko'd once so i'm gonna go with joe pfeiffer but as i said from a betting standpoint i'm not overly 
you know, it, it, this one's iffy because of the odds and shit like that. And because of the opponent that he's facing who can absolutely knock you out if he lands clean, even a single fucking time. Moving up the card to Grant Dawson versus Bobby Green. I'm going to go with Grant Dawson, okay? Look, it was kind of boring what he did to Mir Ismagulov. However, in my opinion, Demir Ismagulov is phenomenal. And he's good everywhere. And he is very, he's defensively sound on the ground. You know what I mean? He has kind of showed us that he can get controlled from time to time. He's not the most physically imposing individual. And to be fair to Grant Dawson, that's probably a pretty smart game plan considering how skilled Demir Ismagulov is on the feet and what kind of shit he can do to you if you don't take him down and control him. Also, dude strangled Mark Madsen, who's a fucking Olympian, in case you forgot. It is his nickname, after all. Finished Jared Gordon without headbutting him first. Got the choke there. Also, he's 29 years old, young and hungry. Bobby Green annoys the fuck out of me. Also, bros, 37. Okay, good for you. You finished an old Tony Ferguson coming off of five losses. Phenomenal. After eye-poking him, you finished Jared Gordon after headbutting him, which damn near looked intentional. And then you got KO'd by Drew Dober before that. It's not like any of his last performances are overly impressive in my opinion he was even getting tagged in the first round by jared gordon do you know what i mean if that headbutt didn't happen who knows how that fight would have gone because jared gordon looked like he was doing fine bobby green landed more shots if i'm not mistaken in that first round but jared gordon was finding that left hook and things like that islam finished him in the first round he got beat by tiago moises grappler seemed to be a little bit of a kryptonite for him i just don't think at this stage in his career, at this age, that he's elite anymore. And I think that Grant Dawson's a fucking savage coming up the rankings, fighting more for glory than he is for money. He wants to get, you know, to the title and shit like that. Whether or not I think that's going to happen, that's why he's fighting. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah. The only thing, I, I hope that he doesn't fucking do some bullshit. Do you know what I mean? I do not want to see an eye poke. Keep your hands closed or fingers up. Keep your fucking head not on the enter entry do you know what i mean don't enter with your head you fuck i really hope that he doesn't pull some bullshit like this in that fight because we've seen it multiple times now and it's pretty goddamn annoying and i know tony ferguson might be exaggerating about how much the eye poke really did for that fight because it's not like he was i, I mean he had moments but he wasn't beating the fuck out of bobby green before that it's just unfortunate because you always have questions when there's a foul in the fight and things like that as the jared gordon one's fucking horrible dude and the fact that he was upset that it got called a no contest you got bro we've seen the kind of damage that headbutts can do to guys like kevin holland has a phenomenal chin jack dalla Maddalena was just cracking him with shots in that fight big shots and he ate them fine steven wonderboy thompson hit him with every fucking thing he had i don't think kevin holland got dropped a single time dude has a phenomenal chin when he fights Dawkins. And he gets headbutted on accident. He got dropped. And we've never seen that from Kevin Holland. So we know the kind of damage headbutts can cause. He absolutely hurt and dropped Jared Gordon with that headbutt. I don't want to see that kind of shit here. I do think Grant Dawson's going to be able to shoot on him. Take him down. Bobby Green's stance. Hands low. Wide stance. Now, to be fair to Bobby Green, that does kind of make it a little bit easier to sprawl when you need to. But your leg is also there for the taking. And against a guy like Grant Dawson, I don't know how much your sprawl is going to do against him. I think that Grant Dawson is going to be able to find the submission somewhere throughout this fight. Probably not in the first round, but maybe third round, something like that. Either way, dude, that's the end of this video. Like and subscribe. I would greatly appreciate it. I'll see you at the next video. Bye-bye.